Thank you, uh, Natalia. It's a pleasure uh, to uh, uh, be here um, and speak to you all again. Um, Apologise for being uh, late. If it's any uh, consolation, the last time I spoke, I was even later. So, um, so at least it's better this time. I will try and be on time uh, uh, next time. Um, as you can see, and as uh, Natalia mentioned, this is the 65th edition of the BP Statistical Review, which is why we have that big 65 in the, in the globe. And I actually have a copy with me of the very first statistical review that we, that we produced in 1952. And it, it's fair to say the review started from fairly humble beginnings. Uh, it's only six pages long. It has this rather cool hand-drawn chart attached to it at the back. It only covered the oil market. And there's a big uh, notice to staff that its contents were strictly confidential and we weren't allowed to share it with anybody else. Lots has changed over the last 65 years. I'm pleased to say very soon after the first one, we started to make the contents available to others. Um, in 1981, it was expanded from the Review of World Oil to the Review of World Energy, which it is today. And even I was reading in the archives in the early 1990s, we started to make the back data available on what was then these newfangled computer disks. Um, albeit we used to charge people then. I'm glad we don't charge uh, people now. So many things have changed um, since then, but, but the underlying aim of the Cisco Review has not changed. Its aim is to provide clear, comprehensive, objective data of energy markets um, over the last year, and then to add that to our past data. In doing so, it helps us make sense. We can look back and helps us make sense of what we just lived through and how to think about the events of the past year and the forces uh, uh, shaping those events. But as well as looking back, when it also helps you to then look forward. The whole point of understanding history is by having a sense of where you've come from gives you a better sense of where you may be going in the, in the future. And so that sense of looking back and forward I'll try and capture today. And I think it is more interesting than perhaps normal to look forward at the moment because the energy world is being captured or is being influenced by two very significant trends which, are, which, are, which played out in 2015 but are likely to continue to play uh, to have a big influence going forward. On the demand side, I think demand is, is we're in a world where demand um, um, is in a period of transition. Over the last 10 or 15 years, we have seen very strong growth in global energy demand. Much of that driven by China with, with very strong growth, double digit growth in China, rapid industrialization, that leading to very strong growth in global energy demand. That process of ch in China is coming to an end. The days of double digit growth and rapid industrialization in China are behind us. Add to that, I think we are seeing increasing focus around the world of using energy more efficiently. Those two things together means we're on the demand side, we're in a process of transitioning to a world of slower growth in global energy demand over the next 10 or 15 years than what we've seen in the past. At the same time, on the supply side, we are sort of surfing a technological wave. Over the last few years, we've seen rapid gains in technology advancements and, and productivity gains, which are increasing the abundance of, of energy supplies, the types and abundance of energy supplies. An obvious example of that within fossil fuels is the US shale revolution, which has fundamentally shifted both oil and gas. But the technological gains are perhaps even more uh, extreme 
within non-fossil uh, fuels, particularly renewable energy, where, for example, uh, solar energy has increased 60-fold uh, um, over the last 10 years, in doubling its capacity every 20 months. We are truly in an age of plenty in terms of supply. And these two forces of slowing demand growth and abundant supply came together in, in 2015 across energy markets. This year's statistical review gives us a good opportunity to observe those events and to understand those events, but also to gauge how they may play out um, in the future. And I'll keep coming back to these two trends when we see uh, the different aspects of the energy markets. So in terms of just, first of all, just giving you some of the main highlights, the big headlines from last year's um, energy markets. Global energy demand, which, see if I can do this. Does this work? Oh, it does. Okay. Um, shown here in the purple line, grew by just 1% last year. That's similar to the growth rate seen in 2014, but is almost half the growth rate seen over the last 10 years. So another period of, of weak growth. I think some of that reflects those structural forces I was telling you about, but it was compounded again last year by cyclical weakness. The global economy, as you well know, remained lacklustre. Moreover, much of the weakness in global economic growth was concentrated in the industrial sector, which tends to be the most energy intensive sector. So some of this I think is cyclical, but there's also an important structural component to it as well. In terms of where, where that weakness was concentrated, a very large part of that weakness um, was in China. Chinese economic growth um, grew by, Chinese um, energy consumption grew by just one and a half percent in 2015. You have to go back to the late 1990s, prior to the period of rapid industrialization, to see such a slow growth in China's energy demand. Um, and, and compares to an average growth rate of well over 5% seen over the last 10 years. Again, I think some of that slowing in, in energy demand growth in China is structural as the economy shifts to this new pattern of growth. But I also think there's a, a cyclical element as well there, and we can perhaps talk more about this. If you look at some of the um, growth in some of the most energy intensive sectors of China, like iron, steel, cement, these are the most energy intensive sectors, output in those sectors actually fell uh, last year. The growth rate didn't only slow, the growth rate was negative. You have to go back 35 years in Chinese history to find a time when, those, when you are seeing negative growth rates. I don't think that is all structural. I think there's a cyclical element to that as well. Outside of China, energy demand growth was pretty similar to its 10-year average. You can see within the OECD economies, growth, if anything, was ever so slightly stronger than normal, buoyed by um, uh, uh, falling energy prices. And within the, within the rest of the developing world, outside of, of China, uh, outside of China, growth is pretty similar. So much of this weakness was emanating from what was going on um, in China. In terms of individual fuels, this was a story of haves and have-nots. Some done well, some didn't. The way, um, so in terms of the, the energies that did well, first of all, uh, in terms of volume growth, um, oil, shown here in the green uh, bars, grew by 1.9 million barrels a day oil demand last year. That's uh, almost twice its 10-year average, so very strong growth in oil demand. And that's simply a story of when the price of something falls by nearly 70 percent, people demand more of it. And so this is a pure price elasticity uh, story driving oil demand. Uh, natural gas bounced back from the very weak growth rates we saw in 2014. I remember standing here a year ago talking about the very weak growth we had seen in natural gas in 2014 and explaining to you this was largely driven by the fact that we had a very mild winter in Europe 
and as a result of which gas consumption had fallen very sharply. That we, um, the, the weather in Europe this year was less mild and hence you got this bounce back in energy uh, natural gas growing by around 1.7 percent so um, stronger than overall energy demand so natural gas gaining share within the primary energy sector within within primary energy although somewhat weaker than its long run growth rate and the third source of energy that done very well was renewable energy as i was just talking to you about growing driven by wind and solar power growing by over 15 percent a year spurred by falling costs and increasing um, productivity. So if overall energy demand growth was weak, and I have three fuels which are growing quite strongly, something must give, something has to give, and that was coal, shown here in, in, the, uh, in the black or well, grey bar here, where coal fell by, uh, coal consumption and coal production fell by the greatest amount on record. Now, our records for coal only date back to 1980, but I'll be very surprised if there was any period before then that you've ever seen a fall in coal of this magnitude. So I think I'll be pretty certain this is uh, the largest fall in coal um, that we've ever seen. And, th and that was what balanced the story. And I'll say a little bit about the, the economic drivers of that um, as we go through. The combination of weak demand and abundant supply had an obvious consequence for prices, um, where we saw uh, sharp falls in the prices of oil, coal, and gas. And I think one of the key points I'll try and bring out as I go through uh, uh, the presentation today is there are clear signs that energy markets responded to the falling prices. Prices work in energy markets. So in some markets, demand was boosted. In other markets, supply responded either in terms of current activity or, invest or future investments were severely curtailed in response to low prices. The fuel mix changed in, in other markets in response to the price signal. And I think this is an important point to sort of remember and think about that this price responsiveness is, I think, is a good thing for the future because markets which tend to respond to prices tend to be, tend to be more stable than those where the response to prices is relatively weak. And you can see quite significant price uh, dimensions going on. So that, if you like, is a very sort of big picture, 10,000 feet view of what happened last year. Weak um, global growth in, of energy demand, much of that coming from China, some of it being a structural story, some of it being a cyclical story. On the, on the individual fuels, some winners, uh, oil, renewables, and to a lesser extent, natural gas, and one big loser, uh, coal. Prices responding to this combination of strong demand and weak supply, and that price responsive having a big impact in markets. What my plan is now is I'll look through each of the market, each of the fuels in a little bit more ter in in a little bit more detail and give you a sense about what was going on in each of those markets, starting first with um, oil and, and refining. Now, some of you, if you have very good memories, may recall that a year ago when I was explaining 2014, I started with the, almost this identical chart. And the point I made when using that chart was to, to try and convince you that the fall in prices that we had observed in, in 2014 was largely a supply story. And I'm, the point I made was if you look at demand in 2014, um, that grew pretty much exactly in line with its 10-year average. There was nothing surprising or unusual about the growth of demand in 2014. What was exceptional was the growth of supply, or more particularly, the growth of non-OPEC supply, shown in that dark green bar, which had grown um, over 2 million barrels a day, far beyond anything they'd ever seen, with much of that um, uh, growth driven by tight oil. And I think I said at the time, you do not need a PhD in economics to know if supply grows by 2 million barrels a day and demand grows by 1 million barrels a day, what will happen to oil prices? And sure enough, prices fell. So now the question is, and so what happened? As prices fell, we got one more year's worth of data. How did the market respond? And the story is one where you did see significant price response. 
but that was offset by some non-price developments as well. So what I'm going to do now is build up this chart to tell you, to explain to you what I think happened last year. So on the demand side, as I said, we saw exceptionally strong growth in oil demand last year, with oil demand growing um, um, by 1.9 million barrels a day. Um, as I say, nearly twice its 10-year average. As you can see from the color coding here, all of that unusual strength was in economies which were net oil importers. So economies which were benefiting from this low oil price. And so you saw unusually strong growth in oil demand in the US, the EU, China, and India. You saw almost no growth, and in fact, a very small decline in, in economies which were net oil exporters as they were suffering from that low oil price, with Russia being uh, a classic example of that, with Russian oil demand falling. But net, um, a significant increase in um, oil demand. In terms of non-OPEC supply, the big impact on non-OPEC supply was felt most immediately within um, US tight oil. So the number of rigs operating in US tight oil peaked in October 2014, and by the end of last year had fallen by around two thirds. In terms of production levels, production of US tight oil peaked in March of 2015 and has been falling ever since and is now over half a million barrels a day below its peak levels. The, the impact on other types of non-OPEC supply um, was more muted because of the, t the extra time lags, but you've, we have seen very significant cuts in investment in terms of oil and, gas, uh, oil and gas investment, which are likely to feed through into supply, um, into supply growth in, the, in, 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 in future years. As a result of what was happening in, in US tight oil, the growth of supply last year was significantly down on the growth rate seen in, in 2014. Still somewhat higher than its 10-year average, but significantly down. If that is all that had happened in 2015, the market would have moved broadly, would have been closer to, by the end of 2015, the market would be pretty close in, to, to moving into balance. Demand would have grown significantly stronger than supply, causing Amy, which would have worked off that, the imbalance we had in the market, causing the, the market to move into balance by the end of last year, if that was all that had happened. But of course it wasn't all that happened, because what we also saw was a very big increase in OPEC supply. This wasn't a general increase in OPEC supply, it was rather the increase in the supply of two OPEC members, Iraq and Saudi Arabia, which together account for the very large share of this impact, of this increase in OPEC production. They account for 90% of this increase in OPEC production. So as a result of this, um, uh, this, this supply, increased supply of OPEC, we had yet another year last year in which supply, which grew by around 2.8 million barrels a day, grew significantly stronger than demand causing the surplus to increase even further and sort of putting back that adjustment back even further. So, let's see if I can, can I do this? No, I can't. Oh, it's okay. So, without, without that non-price adjustment, the market would have balanced, and would be moving to balance, prices work, the market is adjusting, but that adjustment process was put back by what was happening uh, in, uh, by OPEC. If I look at what's happened in the first half of this year, that price adjustment has continued to happen. We expect to see another year of strong growth in demand, perhaps not quite as strong as 2015, but another year in which it'll be well above its long run average. And on the supply side, we see further falls in, in US tight oil, with US tight oil continuing to fall and likely to fall for much of this year. As a result of which, we think by, those two factors together with some of the supply disruptions we've, we've seen um, in, in Canada, in Venezuela, in particular in Nigeria, means the market is likely to move into balance um, during the second half of this year.
But a key point to note here is as the market moves into balance, in a sense, the, the amount of oil produced each day broadly being in, consistent with the amount that needs to be consumed each day, that is not the problem solved. Rather, it, the, it means the problem in terms of accumulating stocks stops getting worse. What we saw last year was stock levels continuing to rise. This chart shows you a story, uh, uh, shows you uh, estimates of OECD inventories, which ended the year around 350 million barrels above normal levels. I don't know what happened in the non-OECD, outside of the OECD, because I don't have data for that. But if you think, it, it, at the moment, the amount of oil consumption in the OECD is quite similar to that in the, in the non-OECD. The, the two sides are pretty similar. So if we think stocks have moved in a similar way to in the non-OECD to the OECD, which seems a fairly reasonable assumption, we could easily be looking at a world of, of stocks above normal levels of six or 700 million barrels. Why do I, why do I think this, that number's interesting? It just gives you a sense about how big that stock overhang is. Suppose uh, over the last year, we've been running a surplus close to, a million barrel, uh, close to one million barrels a day. Suppose demand keeps on growing, so we may end up to a point that we actually have a shortage of a million barrels a day. If you have a shortage of a million barrels a day, but we have a surplus of five or 600 million barrels, simple arithmetic tells you it could easily take 12 or 18 months before you get those stock levels back to normal, uh, close to normal levels. And it is only when you've worked off that significant stock overhang do, do, will the oil market come back anything close um, to balance. So I think that, in, in, a very, in a broad terms, is the story for, um, for 2015 in the oil market. Prices fell, and the market responded to that, both in terms of overall demand and in terms of non-OPEC supply. But that, that process of adjustment was then offset by this increase in, in, not in um, OPEC um, supply. That's carried on growing this year, so I think we're moving into a world where the market is moving into balance in the second half of this year, but that still leaves us with a significant stock overhang, which, um, um, uh, um, which will need to be worn off before we truly come back to, um, and the market truly comes back to anything close to normal. That was all I was going to say on um, oil. If I turn next to natural gas, the big picture story on natural gas is the one where global production continued to grow strongly, but demand outside of the power sector was relatively muted. And those two things together caused gas prices to fall sharply around the world. As gas prices fell sharply around the world, demand for gas within the power sector, which is the most price sensitive component of demand, responded to that, helping to bring the market back into balance. And that, in a sense, is a sort of the simple snapshot of what happened. As always with gas, there's a huge amount of variation across individual countries and across uh, individual um, uh, regions and markets. And I, I will not try and attempt to explain each of these numbers because it could take us uh, for the rest of the afternoon to go through each one of these. The, the big two big stories, regional stories, on the demand side, the weak demand in, um, in gas was dominated by what's happening in China, where, where the growth rate of, of, of of gas consumption in China slowed to below 5%. Um, just to give you a, a sort of orders of magnitude, a couple of years ago, we were talking about growth rates of 16%, 10, uh, 15, 16% of, of growth in China. So this is a very sharp slowing in the growth rate of gas consumption um, in, in China. O on the supply side, the US remained the global powerhouse uh, for, for natural gas. Uh, accounting for around half of the entire um, global production, increase in global production of gas last year. All of that increase in, in U.S. gas production was from U.S. shale gas. 
um, conventional gas production fell last year. So this is a story that part of that technological wave I was telling you about, a very strong growth in, in US shale gas. If we stand back from the country detail of, of the gas market, I think there were sort of three sort of general themes um, 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 which emerged from the gas market last year, which I think are interesting in terms of understanding um, some of the factors which may continue into the future. The first theme was we saw gas increase its share within the power sector quite significantly, with the most pronounced impact of that within the US. So what we saw last year, as the competitiveness of, of gas, as pr gas prices fell, the price competitiveness of gas relative to coal significantly increased, which is shown here in this right-hand line. And as a result of which, you saw a, a, a gas overtake coal to be the most significant dominant source of fuel in the US power sector, the first time that's ever happened. And I think the shift in, in shares that you see here um, is really quite, um, was really quite um, pronounced. And again, there's another example of prices at action. The, the strong growth of US shale gas forced down Henry Hub prices, and that as a result of which forced out um, coal. Um, um, interestingly, if you look, one saw a similar uh, period in 2012, when again, gas prices fell quite sharply, and you saw gas gain share relative to coal in 2012. Interestingly, in 2012, when, when that happened, that surplus coal which was produced in the US was exported to other parts of the world. We were hearing stories about Germany importing lots of cheap American coal. The general um, uh, abundance of, of coal and of energy across the world this year meant that was far harder for that, the, that coal to be exported to the rest of the world. So what we saw last year was US coal production pretty much fall in lockstep at the, at the same amount as US coal consumption. So you saw both production and cons uh, consumption and production of US coal fall together uh, last year. So story number one is this quite significant shift in, um, in, the, uh, in the share of, with gas gaining share relative to coal in a number of power sectors, most pronounced in the US. The second theme I wanted to pull out is um, in terms of the shift in pattern of um, liquefied natural gas, LNG flows. So global supplies of liquefied of LNG increased again last year with increases in uh, Australia, Papua New Guinea, and Qatar. But the slowing growth of gas consumption in China, together with outright falls of, of LNG demand in, in both Korea and Japan as nuclear reactors came back on stream, meant that um, Asian LNG demand was very weak last year. As a result, LNG flows were diverted west. So they were diverted west away from Asia into the Middle East and North Africa and into Europe. And as those flows were diverted um, west, so too, as a result, the price premium on, on Asian LNG relative to Europe was significantly squeezed, which is what you can see in this chart here, that price differential being eradicated away. I think the meta point here, the big picture point here, is, and the point for the future, is as global energy supplies grow in importance, international gas trade will become increasingly price sensitive because of the nature of LNG flows. As that happens, that means that shocks in one part of the world, in this case, weak, weakness in Asia, will then be transmitted to other parts of the globe via LNG, which is what we saw here. That weakness in, in, Euro, in Asian demand led to a fall in European gas prices because of the mechanism by which that was then because of the, because the distribution flows of LNG. So we are moving towards an in globally integrate, integrated gas market, just like we have a globally integrated oil market with LNG providing that mechanism. 
The third interesting point, I think, uh, which emerged from last year, directly stems from this increasing flows of LNG flowing into Europe and the downward pressure on prices. And it raises the question, well, how did Russian exporters, um, gas exporters, respond to that? How, how did they respond? And there may well be people here who know far more about this than, than I do, so you must correct me at the end if, if what I say doesn't sound right. I, so what I wanted to know is, can I, what I really wanted to see was, how did Gazprom's prices respond to this? The trouble is I can't observe uh, Gazprom's prices um, because they are nearly all contractually with individual contracts and so I can't observe them directly. However, I can sort of produce a proxy of them by looking at average German import prices, looking at the composition of those imports, allocating prices to the non-Russian ones, and then backing out what an implied price for, the, um, for Russian export prices to Europe must look like. And that's what this red line shows. And it compares it against both um, spot prices. And the, what the green line says was, if... Russian export prices have moved purely in terms of an oil index contract, which is about what the vast majority of those contracts are, they would have followed something like the green line. And what our proxy line suggests is prices fell far more quickly than a pure oil index contract would have suggested. So the implication here is that Gazprom responded to this increased competition from other markets by, by, by reducing its prices, competing on price, in order to maintain its market share. If you like, this behaviour is very akin to how OPEC responded to the increased supply from US tight oil. When the underlying source of the shock is expected to persist, be it US tight oil in terms of um, the oil market, or be it um, increased LNG supplies in the European gas market, the attraction of giving up market share in order to maintain price is far less attractive thing to do. And, and, and the, more, the economically rational thing to do is compete on price in order to maintain your market share. And indeed, that's exactly what we think we saw uh, Gazprom do last year. And, and I'm sure um, if there's somebody from Gazprom here and that's wrong, they, they should correct me when I'm finished. And I'll be very here. And, and, you know, one of the joys of doing these types of talks is you learn. So please, if, they, if we've got this wrong, um, you should tell us. So there are sort of two or three of the big themes we think coming out uh, of the gas market last year. A lot of them concerning the role of prices. So prices playing a big role, allowing gas to crowd out coal within the power sector. Prices being, trans being transmitted, being used as a way of transmitting shocks around the world via the price sensitive nature of, of LNG flows. And this, 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 this um, observation that we saw um, Gazprom competing on price in order to maintain market share um, within Europe. If we turn to coal, as I said, coal um, was the main casualty, the main loser last year. And if you like, when you to think, well, what happened to coal? It, it was a, main, a direct casualty of those two big shocks I started from that sort of transitioning in energy demand and the technological wave. In terms of the technological wave story, the main, the main source of that was what happened in, in, in the US, which I just told you about. That's the technological wave in terms of US shale gas causing um, coal to lose share and as a result of which a big fall in US coal consumption. And that fall in U.S. coal consumption accounted for around two-thirds of the global fall in, in, in coal consumption in 2015. So U.S. was absolutely central to that story. That's a story on the sort of technological wave side. In terms of the transitioning in energy demand, that was most pronounced in terms of what happened in China, where China's coal consumption fell for the second consecutive year in, in 2015. So, as you all know, um, China's coal consumption had in has increased extraordinarily rapidly um, uh, through much of the last 10 years or so as it fueled the process of rapid industrialization in China. As that's come to an end, that growth rate has slowed, and in the last two years, we've seen negative growth in China's um, coal consumption. 
That then raises sort of this big picture question is, has Chinese coal consumption peaked? And I think there are sort of structural forces you can point to which, in, which may well suggest it may well have done. So first of all, this sort of shift in the pattern of, of growth towards slower growth, shifting away from the heavy industrial, heavy energy intensive sectors towards more service, consumer facing growth, which tends to be far less energy intensive. And also this clear commitment that you see being displayed within China to shift away from coal into sort of cleaner, lower carbon fuels. Those, those forces suggest perhaps this will, will continue. On the other side, there is this big cyclical component I was telling you about with, with um, those most energy intensive sectors, but also the most coal intensive sectors like iron, steel, cement, falling in absolute terms uh, in 2015 and are likely to continue to do that into the future may well unwind. And the net impact of those structural forces which are pushing down and the cyclical components which may well unwind, I think is unclear which of those two it is. I think it is um, almost certain that, that within a secular trend, um, the growth in, in Chinese coal consumption is going to slow relative to the very strong growth rates we've seen in the past. But whether we've actually seen it peak or not, I think is too soon to say because it reflects the nature of these two offsetting um, components. An obvious question raised by the strong growth in renewable uh, growth at the moment is, well, if this continues to grow so rapidly, how quickly could renewables start to gain a very significant share of primary energy? Could we see them crowding out fossil fuels to a very significant extent? And this is when the joy of, of doing historic things can, can be um, useful, because we can look back and sort of see what history has to tell us about uh, this uh, question. So what this chart does, and I'll explain it, because once you understand how to read the chart, I think it's quite a fascinating chart. What this chart does, it starts the clock at each point at which uh, a fuel reached 1% share of primary energy. So, as you can see, for oil, that was in 1877, uh, for gas, 1869, and, and for renewables in, in the mid-2000s. And then, from starting from that point, it then goes over 50 years and sees how quickly each of those fuels gained share over the next 50 years from the point where they got 1%. So what you can see is it took oil about 45 years to, to get to double digit, to get to a share of primary energy of around 10%. For natural gas, shown in, in red, even after 50 years, natural gas had not reached a, a share of 10% of primary energy. And this slow penetration of, of new 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 energies within, within the global energy market, I think reflects two sort of big factors. One, it takes time for resources and funding to be devoted in sufficient scale for these new energies uh, to really grow and take a very significant foothold. And added to that is the, the, the sort of the ecosystem of energy is very highly capital intensive. It has very long-lived assets like power stations, which last for 40 years. And that provides a natural break on the pace at which new energies can gain significant footholds within um, the power, um, within, within total energy. What we have seen so far in terms of renewable energy, which is about, which has had, which sort of its clock started running about eight or nine years ago, is so far, uh, it's followed a, a path very similar to what we saw uh, as nuclear power. But as many as you will know, the penetration of nuclear power plateau plateaued off relatively quickly as the pace at which its costs were coming down started to flatten off. And so that penetration, um, 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 uh, it, the, that penetration also started to stabilize. In contrast, our view of BP is that we're likely to see continued um, productivity gains, continued technological advancements in renewables, so that so their costs continue to fall, which will underpin strong growth over the next 20 years. And so, um, in terms of our energy outlook, which I, which I talked about the last time I was here a few months ago, 
We have a renewable energy continuing to grow strongly over the next 20 years. And indeed, our base case implies that renewable energy will go faster than any fuel ever seen in history. So you just look at that chart and it implies that renewable energy is growing up faster than any fuel ever seen in history. But even allowing for that, after 20 years, renewable only energy still only provides 8 or 9% of the world's energy needs. It's still providing less than 10% of the world's energy needs, even if it grows faster than any other fuel ever seen in history. Now, it may well be that history this time doesn't apply, um, but I think economists at their peril tend to throw away the lessons from history. And the lessons from history is, is it, it takes a long time, numbering many decades, for new, fossil, for new fuels to gain significant footholds um, within primary energy. The final point I wanted to talk about is that of um, carbon emissions. When we produce a new um, uh, statistical review, there are literally thousands upon thousands of new observations, new data observations in, in the statistical review here and on the website. I think perhaps the single most interesting uh, data observation this year is that on carbon emissions, where the combination of slow growth in global energy demand combined with this shift in the fuel mix away from coal towards um, cleaner fuels, natural gas and renewable energy, meant that the growth rate of carbon emissions stalled um, in, 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 in um, 2015. Essentially, there was a growth of just 0.1%, so essentially flat carbon emissions in 2015. Other than um, the, um, um, the period immediately surrounding the financial crisis, that's the slowest growth in carbon emissions for a quarter of a century. Um, and, and compares to an average growth rate over the last 10 years, an average growth of around 1.5%. What I try and do in this next chart and say is, well, if I compare the growth rate of, of I saw in 2015 of 0.1% with that 10-year average of 1.5%, what were the economic factors which caused that slowdown? How do I think about it? Some of it, shown in the orange bar, reflects that growth last year was slower than the average rate seen in the past. And that provides, gives you a, um, one counts for some of it. But you can see the vast majority of this was caused by faster rates of improvement in both energy intensity and in improvements in the fuel mix. So these are good things. You know, slower growth is not a good reason. To, it's not a sort of something to celebrate. But improvements in energy intensity and improvements in the fuel mix are, are, are obviously significantly good things. If I ask the same question in terms of what drove, drove this slowdown, but rather in terms of economic drivers, if I ask the question in terms of um, individual countries and regions, you can see that the main factor which caused um, carbon emissions to fall was China. China's carbon emissions fell, actually declined uh, last year, which is the first time they've declined for over 20 years. Um, and compares to an average growth rate over the last 10 years of carb carbon emissions growth of over 4.5%. So this obviously raises a big question for all of us is, um, is this likely to persist? Is this very sharp slowdown in China's carbon emissions likely to be maintained? And the answer to that question is almost, uh, the sort of arguments and the, 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 the way to think about it is almost identical to that question we just talked about in terms of China's um, coal consumption. There's some structural for forces which are likely to persist and grow in importance as you shift away from um, strong growth towards slower, um, slower, less energy intensive growth and you see this shift in the fuel mix. But as I said, I also think some of this slowdown reflects this very sharp cyclical slowdown, particularly in some of those energy intensive sectors, which I don't think are likely to be continued uh, into the future. Another way of thinking about this carbon emissions uh, story is um, to think about the impact on carbon intensity of GDP. 
So the carbon intensity of GDP is how the average amount of carbon emitted per unit of GDP. Okay? And what we saw last year, because GDP continued to grow, but carbon emissions were essentially flat, carbon intensity of GDP fell by 2.8% last year. How did you think about that 2.8% fall in carbon intensity of GDP? Well, one way of thinking about it is, if you look back over the last 50 years, there was only two other occasions in the last 50 years in which carbon intensity of GDP has fallen by that much. And both of those occasions were, were periods where you saw very sharp spikes in oil prices. So this is real progress in terms of um, moving towards a lower carbon world. That's the sort of rosy, good, new, good, good news view way of thinking about that 2.8 number. The bad news way, or the less positive, optimistic way of thinking about that car, bad news number, is if you ask, if you look at something like the IEA 450 scenario, which many people use as a benchmark scenario of what we need to achieve if we're to get close to achieving the Paris goals, that suggests that carbon intensity needs to fall by something like 5.5% a year for the next 20 years. So double what we achieved this year, every year for the next 20 years. This is just another way of telling, of just reminding us the scale of the challenge associated um, um, with meeting the Paris goals. We need to do something far, far beyond anything we've ever seen in history before. So what we saw this year was a step in the right direction, but a relatively small step given the huge magnitude of the challenge associated with, um, um, with um, achieving the goals set out in Paris. Um, so let me conclude, and then I can um, um, throw it open to questions and, and, and corrections as well, if I've said things which people disagree with. In terms of just concluding, in 2015, um, as a, another year of weak growth in global demand, as I said, some of that structure reflecting this transition in, 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 to, in, we're seeing in, in the structural de global demand for energy, but also compounded by a particular cyc cyclical weakness, particularly perhaps in China. Um, in terms of individual fuels, there's winners and losers, oil, renewables, and to a lesser extent, natural gas winning. The main loser, coal, with a key driver in terms of those winners and losers being prices and prices work. And that's an important thing when thinking about stability of long run energy markets. And this um, carbon emissions number, the best um, for quarter of a century, but uh, so a step in the right direction, but a relatively small step to what we need to see. And then going forward, likely to see these two big trends continuing <coughs> to play out as we go forward, this transitioning in, in, in the global demand for energy to a slower growth rate, and on the supply side, this technological wave driving increasing abundance of supplies. And I think that is likely to be a theme for many future um, statistical reviews. Let me stop there and, and throw it open. Thank you very much.